Hello to all my book lovers and Bradley Cooper fangirls out there. My name is Ian, and on this channel, we break down the greatest books and ideas ever. We also take those great books and ideas and turn them into actionable steps to transform the world because what is knowledge if we don't do anything with it? But today we are talking about Bradley Cooper and I am just as surprised as you are that Bradley Cooper has a beautiful book list. And that's the only reason we're talking about him. I don't like Bradley Cooper as an actor really at all. I thought that American Sniper was pretty good, but it was a romanticization of a 100% unjustified and unnecessary war. But his book list is maybe the best one I've ever seen for a celebrity. And I'd really like to talk about the books on it because they are all pretty good, if not great. I would choose some of them for my top 10 list too. So first one we are going to be talking about is The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. And this is what Bradley Cooper has to say about it. Quote, what can I say? I remember reading it in school, and it was one of the first books that made me realize I loved reading. There's something about traveling down the river, the flow, and how he made me see and smell the environment. It really transported me to a different time. And Cooper is 100% correct here. Twain is a great writer, a beautiful writer, really takes you down and can connect you with nature to a time that most of us don't connect with anymore. And if we do, it was in childhood during the summer. However, Twain has a tampered legacy now because he has been canceled. He is. 170 years later being x-rayed and canceled and trying to be brought out of not just the school system but just reading and libraries in general i hate how the there is this concept there's books that get canceled then there's books that get banned the left and the right both love to cancel books cancel ideas because if we loved ideas if we became more intelligent and grew we wouldn't need the two political parties in the united states we could transcend politics altogether but we are talking about bradley cooper and mark twain and i think that the adventures of huckleberry finn are is excuse me is mark twain's best book that's my opinion i've read a couple and i said this a couple weeks ago because we were just or a couple days ago in another video ranking classical novels go check out that one if you're interested that mark twain is a great thing to read while you're on holiday while you're on vacation, maybe you're gonna go visit your parents or you still attend Christmas break or you know, go on a beach vacation. He's a, it's a really light, fun, easy read, but it's also substantial, it's also historical. It's something that I would recommend everybody try. Like I said, I got told that by a, one of my professors, hey, you should go read some Mark Twain on your Christmas break. He's the best person to read during Christmas break. And I was like, yeah, 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 but I did. And it was actually really good. And I saw why I should do that. So next on the list is, and look at these Google ads, RadicalReads.com, Lolita by Vladimir Nabokov. Nabokov's writing is brilliant, especially considering that English was his third language. And I absolutely agree. Look, David Bowie, I 100% agree that Lolita by Nabokov is a very, very good book, especially in terms of like the classic novels. I just two days ago rewatched the 1962 version with my partner because she had never seen it before or has never read the book before. And I was like, oh, you gotta see this real fast. And I was like, do you wanna read the book? And she's like, oh, not right now. So I was like, okay, let's watch the old one. I wanted to, I'm on a Stanley Kubrick kick and I've never actually seen the old one. I've read the book, but I never saw the movie and I watched the movie and you know, that one's a little bit weird. It's a lot <coughs> different than the book, but Lolita, once again, an author with a, a book with a bad reputation, but has imagination and craft to the novel, to the text, has dares to move beyond what we normally our normal societal conventions and yes it is through pedophilia really weird he's banging a 12 year old that's insane that's not right in any context in any way and what's really crazy this is a random fact the age of a consent in the philippines is 12 years old that's absolutely ridiculous i was told that by one of my students who was from the philippines and said you know she was telling a story about like her cousin or something getting pregnant at 12 and i was like is that legal who by another boy and she's like no by an adult man by a guy and who actually anyway but lolita and and its relation to pedophilia very weird shouldn't be glorified but needs to be understood and explored to then be vilified to then understand what the hell is going wrong and the mental hues and issues and problems that we have we need to understand this we need to understand this so that we can mitigate it and not just understand it by glorifying it but these things cannot be shunned. I know so many people, like for instance, I know so many guys who never go deeper into their sex life because it they th it thinks it makes them emasculated and makes them feel makes them weird to talk about that with their partner. But it's like, no, everyone will be happier. Everyone will feel heard and satisfied if you just talk about it. It's not you. It's this is about them. 
And I feel like that's with pedophilia and a lot of these things that we try to shun away from our thought and from our society. To actually get rid of it, we need to talk about it more. We need to say there's people out there like this and we need to get rid of them. We need to find them and help them get over this. Not help, yeah. Next is Geek, a, a novel by Catherine Dunn. There's a fantastical nature to this family, yet you can really relate to all the richly drawn characters. And I read this book about 10 years ago and I would agree. I read this because it was rec recommended by Kurt Cobain. And I don't think that this makes my top 1,000 list. I would say steer clear of Geek Love, a novel. I would say that this doesn't, you know, I'm 22, 2300 books read in the last, you know, 13 years. And this is not even cut into the top 1500. So we'll just nothing really to say about Geek Love. Next, we have Revolutionary Road by Richard Yates. And I want, I've never really seen suburbia portrayed in such a way that was so riveting. He really captured it. And yes, Revolutionary Road is one of the best books out there on that, on suburban life, on this weird, deluded, po modernist life. It's almost comparable. When I read it, it made me almost feel like Blue Velvet by David Lynch did. I had a buddy who I just gave it to, that book to and he finished it in one day. It's a pretty big book too. It's four or 500 pages and he finished it in one day. Started at like at three or 4 p.m. too and went to like two or three in the morning because he, it, it's one of those books, man, that really makes you feel like, I'm sure right now you're probably not out in the country. Maybe you are, but you're probably hearing this in a little box in a neighborhood like I'm here, like I'm, you know, like I am. And you were maybe, you were probably raised in a suburban environment and it subverts you in a weird way there are so many weird issues and repression um things that get repressed in the suburban life most of the time so 100 recommend revolutionary road that probably makes my top 25 novel list for sure next and this is my favorite novel probably my favorite book of all time blood meridian by cormac mccarthy and just look at the list bruce springsteen casual ishiguru and stephen king also recommend it and this these aren't these are just a couple authors if you think about it like Kasha Ishiguro and Stephen King agree on something, and those are two geniuses from different fields of literature, then it's like, okay, something's something's happening here. I mean, I can also add to that list, Harold Bloom, David Foster Wallace, uh, a couple other people are slipping in my mind. Some of the greatest authors and thinkers of our generation view Blood Meridian as one of the best books of all time. And if you haven't read it, you need to read it. We're going to have a Cormac McCarthy course soon on this channel. Go check that out. Go check out my website, ianjamescadnack.com, link down in the description below. But Blood Meridian is a Western, Gothic, Biblical, postmodern mayhem book. Written, I think, in 1985, so it's still modern, by Cormac McCarthy, who I think is the greatest living author right now, maybe one of the greatest authors of all time, because he is from the old world. He did not touch, let technology touch him. He spent tens of thousands of hours writing in poverty, not having toothpaste, not having food, having his wife leave him with their child because they were living in such impoverished conditions so he could keep writing he connected with nature he understands god and spirituality and he is talented that is all that you can ask for and if you are in tune with nature and life and spirituality you have to read cormac mccarthy because you will have your mind blown the symbolism is so deep go check out my video greatest living author on this channel if you want to hear me go a little bit more about cormac mccarthy and like i said I'm about to have a course drop in so and he says you can pick any book by Cormac McCarthy, really, but all the characters, the judge in particular, are just incredible. And I agree that I can't wait for this film to be adapted one day. It's going to be, and it's probably going to fail, but the writing in this, it's third person omnipotent. You never see third person omnipotent get used very often, and he does it in the most King James Bible biblical way. He is in the lineage of King James Bible, to Melville, to Hemingway, to Faulkner, then to, Hemi uh, to McCarthy. That's kind of the lineage that he's in, the literature lineage. And I think that's one of the strongest lineages ever in terms of, um, especially if you like American, you know, American, oh, American writing. It is like almost like if you follow the French lineage of Proust, it it's following that, it's that level of strength. So Cormac McCarthy, everybody. Another great novel is The Unbearable Lightness of Being by Mil Milan Kundra. The idea of playing with the structure of a traditional novel and the characters he creates and the author's voice in them was really eye-opening. And I agree, this is one of the most, this is a very experimental, beautiful novel that I think it's an intermediate novel that most people can get. Blood Meridian, some people are gonna fall off. Some people aren't going to understand it. But The Unbearable Lightness of Being is a novel that a lot of people can pick up, a lot of younger people can pick up, people that don't read very often. It's actually one of those transfer, transformational books that can really help you and yeah. One of my favorites, you know, like I said, probably makes the top 25, maybe the top 50 I'd have laid out. This is such a wild pick right here. 
Such a wild pick. I can't believe he did this. I, I, when I saw this, I was like, oh my God, I have to do this. Do you know who N, N, N Scott Mamade is? Probably not. I think he's the first Pulitzer Prize winner as a uh, Native American author. I think he's the only one still who's won a Pulitzer Prize or a National Book Award. I can't remember which one right now for House of Dawn, it's just, which is like kind of a really postmodern, weird Native American book. It's disconnected timelines, of murder, and really, really kind of wonky. But N Scott Mamade is also a painter, you know, an artist. He's a poet. And this is kind of a nonfiction work. And it's about the blanking on the tribe right now. You know, it's not probably very good of me, but a certain tribe got kicked out of Oklahoma and had to, or a certain state and had to walk thousands of miles. And this is kind of a depiction of the, of, of that journey and among other things. And it's called the way to rainy mountain. And it is absolutely a, so it's the Kiowa tribe and they started in Montana and they had to they had to, they got, they got in some battles and eventually surrendered. Then they marched, you know, walked to Oklahoma, which, oh my God, you know, that's absolutely ridiculous. There's no one, it's absolute travesty. And, you know, I'm sure if you've ever been to Oklahoma, like I have, it's not the Hanna. Polar opposite worlds. And it's a mix of memoir, folklore, among other things, and poetry. And Bradley says, N. Scott Mamaday is a poet and there's a musicality to the poetry. That's great. And like I said, I'm just so surprised about this pick. I've never heard anyone talk about this. I've taken, I've even taken multiple Native American lit classes, probably five Native American lit classes, graduate, undergrad. And we never, I mean, we've talked about N. Scott Mamaday. He's like an OG in the game, uh, in the field, but like, no, we never read this book. It's not like one of the, it's not like really on the top 25 or even top 50 books, like most of the time for like Native American lit. Maybe it is, but you know, it's a really wild book and I would recommend people reading it. It's a little, it can feel a little bit dragging, but once you understand the context and what's happening and what's been lost and what, how it's screwed over, like the situation is, it's like, oh my God. And then Scott Mamaday, he's a great autobiography. He, he isn't bitter about it either. And like, obviously you can't be bitter, like shit, be bitter, be bitter about all of it. But he really comes from a place of like re trying to restore it from what I felt like trying to, you know, just create a memory and make sure that it still is is carried on so i think i think that is really really cool next we have another native american book it's the lone ranger and tonto fistfight in heaven by sherman by sherman alexi and an amazing series of short stories that really allowed you to relate to these native american characters and sherman alexi is canceled now he's he apparently sexually abused some people or maybe not abused but he manipulated his power in certain positions uh have sex with people maybe and you can i guess argue if that was consensual or not for instance helping people get certain positions at colleges through his power through having sex with them or their relations i think that i mean that's obviously not right but you know the, it might be a little bit murkier than that go read up on it and before all that happened you know i'm a little bit iffy obviously if you've heard my channel before on cancel culture and you know i believe innocent until proven guilty but before he got canceled my native american lit professor one of them who's like really in the scene like publishes books and knows everybody and has been been part of it for 30 years he said that Sherman Alexi was an absolute dick that he had dealt with them multiple times and everyone know, knew in the community that he was just an absolute a-hole and a jerk uh, at his tribe Sherman Alexi came to his tribe when he was a student and spoke and he came back from college to see him speak and he said that after he was done speaking he was gave a very vulgar presentation very weird it wasn't even like fiction reading he gave like a almost like a non-fiction presentation on some Native American related issue and some elders in the tribe like literally the elders of the tribe tried asking him some questions and he got mad at them not just like mad at them but like chastised them and like was yeah just being mean to them but uh, and so like when I heard all the sexual assault stuff and I heard all those stories and I got told multiple stories of the same kind of uh, on the same kind of uh, grain I was like oh shit like this kind of seems like one and when there's smoke there's fire right when someone's acting like this especially in like an environment where they're getting paid and they can obviously just be nice and like answer questions and it's like a family it was a family event like there were families there you don't need to you know be as vulgar or crazy you know then it's like okay this is the type of person that would maybe be taking advantage of people for sex because that happens all the time it's very common you know obviously tangent here but it's very common like people do it all the time at jobs and stuff every job i've worked at the manager is you know taking advantage of their power and you know banging most of the time female associates and in exchange for you know different different things it, you know sometimes it's consensual but it never feels like that but sherman alexi is a hell of a writer you know it's kind of one of these situations like what do we do with sherman alexi he's a these these this collection of short, short stories is really good i've read five or six sherman alexi books and he's one of the best 
Native American writers, and a lot of people don't teach him anymore and avoid talking about him, but a really good author. So what do we do? What do we do? Leave a comment down below. What do we do with people like this? Just ignore them forever? Do we just read the books from the past and not publish or read anything that's new? What do you do when these things are out there? What do you do with a talent from a person that's crazy? Do we, like I said, do we ignore, do we ignore it or can we separate art and, you know, these types of actions or this type of attitude, even minus all the sexual assault allegations, just him being a jerk to everyone. It's hard. It's a hard question. Who do we give, you know, cause there's only much in the reading. It's not like this is the video game world or like TikTok. There's only so much money to go around in the book publishers power anymore. So next we have, so I, I thought that was an interesting pick. I mean, just because of like those things, I would never, like I said, just because of him being a jerk. Like I said, this is all Google. You can Google all this. Like, and I'm always surprised by people. And this is that when, like I said, when there's smoke, there's fire. When people are being weird, when people have bad idiosyncrasies, if they like money too much, they like power too much, they like the spotlight too much, it seems like a narcissist, all, a lot of other, a host of other issues are gonna come. It might be sexual assault stuff, it might be identity theft, and it's like, what we're, what are we doing in this community? We need to be protecting these people. We need to have shunned him before and say, be gone, be a recluse writer. We're not going to bring you to events anymore or do any of this, like, be gone. So that, you know, so they, do, they don't have that power to, be the head of a creative writing program and be able to get people in. What do you think a jerk like that's going to do? He's going to find that and exploit the, the 22, 23, 24 year old women who want to get into that program because they meet him, you know, it's like, I think it was like a native American program uh, for native American indigenous authors. And of course he's going to meet them because he's on the speaking circuit and make friends with them. And then, you know, it's just, it's a weird exchange. The Giving Tree by Shel Silverstein. Just the sadness, the other sadness of their simplistic relationship really struck me as a young kid. I would agree. This is kind of an underrated book, I think, but The Giving Tree is a really good book, man. Eco-friendly, I mean, not, it's kind of sad, but an eco-friendly book that a lot of us have lost that connection once again, and it's very sad. And last is The Fountainhead, The Fountainhead by Anne R So I know there's a lot of hate for Anne Rand out there in the chat, and I get it. Because if you're stuck in the Hegelian dialectic and if you're a liberal, you're going to hate Ayn Rand, and you should. Just as if you're a conservative, you should hate, you know, some one of the million one of the many authors on the left. But once you have escaped the dialect, once you read enough and think enough and feel enough to escape it, I can see where Ayn Rand's coming from. A lot of her points are really good. The Fountainhead, for instance, Atlas Shrugged, Anthem. They're actually really good books. Some of her philosophy books have some decent points in them. You have to move to the extremes of society, just like how a lot of extreme postmodernist authors who are very much to the left of the center of, you know, most of them who, where most of America sits have a lot of good ideas. And if you think, have a bad opinion of Ayn Rand, that just means that you've been duped. That means that you are on one side of a political aisle and you and you got duped and you need to do the work and read authors like this on that's what i always wonder especially this that the like ann rand if you don't like ann rand, how many books of ann rand have you read if you don't like ann rand or have you just heard what you've heard about ann rand because there's a bunch of ann rand trolls out there on the right that just spew her all the time i ask the same thing to everyone i know if you want to talk about the economy have you read books on the left and the right on anything there both sides are so skewed especially on the left now and the right's becoming the same way because you have to read things from both sides especially if there's a dialect if you want to understand the human experience if you want to find the best answers usually they're at maybe not in the extremes but a little bit away from the extremes but pretty far away from the center if you want to find the art and the love there's so much on each side and people demonize and separate over this but at, if you got rid of all the political labels and everything. Everyone's basically the same and has similar ideas. And even a political author like Anne Rand in The Fountainhead, which is really about innovation and killing creativity. And she's not wrong. I work in the public, you know, I'm a teacher in a public school. I have seen innovation just getting killed every single day. Participation trophies, uh, the dumbing down of the classroom, the, can't, the catering and pandering to students and weaklings. It's absolutely ridiculous that there are strong kids that need strong teachers and strong classmates and strong thinking and skills, but they can't have that because someone might feel bad if they get left behind or they don't know what you're talking about. You can't speak. You have to speak to the dumbest person in the room. And most of the time they're really dumb and they shouldn't be in the class in the first place. So then it just turns into an absolute mess where the strong can't grow and the weak can't grow either. And it's okay to be weak. 
I was once weak. But, you know, I don't want to take a very Nietzschean view here, but Ayn Rand has a point that innovation is important, that it requires at some level, I don't really like the idea of competition, but it requires a burning desire and obsession. And that can't be, that is getting killed now. And that's one of the things, that's one of the critiques that you can get from the right that I think is true. It's almost always been true. It's what communism did. You have to have that. If you want to create a utopia with a capital U, you have to understand that. You have to be able to take the ideas. From the left, if, you know, like I said, every time I bag, every time I bag on one side of this channel, I'll go to the other side. On the right, they absolutely suck at progressive thinking. They are, mo you know, a lot of people on the right are absolutely closed-minded, have no progressive thought at all in their bones, and they are rigid. And it's ridiculous because we can't move forward. They'll always will be there, blocking the way of progress, saying, "Oh." And same thing, they're blocking the way of actual emotional or spiritual progress to continue their social fabric, their value system that is outdated, an outdated modality in 2022 that's actually based in control, even though they act like it's based in freedom. So, you know, both sides absolutely suck. And that's how we are going to end the video today about Bradley Cooper's favorite books. I think that this was a very good list. And if you guys would like to see David Lynch's favorite book list, go check it out right here.